Good afternoon, or good morning, good evening, good middle of the night, wherever you are. Welcome. We're excited to have you here. Um, we have an exciting program for you. I'm Vincent Aleven, but before I introduce myself and, of course, our guests, uh, Sarah Fox and Ken Holstein, let me say that this is the sixth event of the SES New Faculty Introduction Series. The purpose of our series is to introduce to you, to the SES community, some of the newest faculty members. And we encourage you highly to make this an interactive event. So please participate, please ask questions using the QA functions. We'll do our best to answer all questions live. We may actually run out of time before we run out of questions, but uh, the more interactive, the better. Just a little bit about me before we uh, turn to Ken and to Sarah. I'm a professor of human computer interaction. So I work at Carnegie Mellon uh, for about 25 years now in the Human Computer Interaction Institute. My research focuses on, uh, using, on using AI to uh, make education better. So we're doing some work on the, creating the smart classroom of the future, working mostly in K-12 in schools. But in addition to doing research, I'm also the director of undergraduate programs in the Human Computer Interaction Institute. We have many undergraduates. We have actually more than 250 undergraduates in our various programs. So we have a minor, we have a second major, and this year for the first time, we have a primary major within the School of Computer Science. So the fourth major within SCS just started actually the freshman class just declared their majors, but they haven't told us yet how many chose the HCI major. So the suspense is killing me, but I haven't heard, so I cannot share that with you. As mentioned, I've been at a Human Computer Interaction for, uh, Institute for 25 years. It's a wonderful place to work, wonderful, wonderful place. And one reason why it's such a great place is I have amazing colleagues. And so I'm really pleased to introduce to you two of them today, Sarah Fox, and Ken Holstein, so we'll be talking to them, we'll be hearing from them. Sarah uh, has a BA in Film Studies, English and Telecommunication Arts from the University of Georgia. She has an MS in Digital Media from Georgia Institute of Technology. She has a PhD in MS in Human-Centered Design and Engineering from the University of Washington. And after she did that, she was a postdoctoral scholar in the Department of Communication and in the Design Lab at UC San Diego. Then she became a postdoctoral fellow at CMU in 2019, where she became an assistant professor the last year in 2020. In her research, as you'll see, she examines how technological artifacts challenge or propagate social exclusions. And then she explores how to create alternatives, better technologies, um, that are more inclusive of more people. Our second guest, Ken Holstein, grew up in Pittsburgh. He has a BS in psychology with a focus on cognitive psychology from the University of Pittsburgh, where he also did a minor in computer science. Then he joined Carnegie Mellon. He did a PhD and an MS in human computer interaction was a postdoc in the Human Computer Interaction Institute for a short while until he became last year in 2020, an assistant professor in human computer interaction. His research focuses on how we can use digital technology uh, so that humans and artificial intelligence can synergistically work together, especially in caring professions and especially in a way that is fair, ethical and equitable. So we're thrilled to have them here. We're very curious to hear more about their work. And they have actually, they will be treating us first before we go into the Q&A to two pre-recorded videos uh, that uh, dive into a little bit more detail about Ken and Sarah's research. And as you will see in their video presentations, they are very prolific scholars. So hi, I'm Ken Holstein, and I lead the Koala Lab at CMU HCII. Uh, we create new technologies in the Koala Lab to uh, complement and bring out the best of human ability in fundamentally human endeavors. So AI systems are increasingly being used to support care-based, creative, and social forms of work. 
In these contexts, the use of AI has great potential to augment and amplify professionals' abilities. However, if not designed carefully, human AI collaboration can just as easily make things worse. We're living through a time in which mass protests are held over the way AI systems are used in practice. As just one out of a growing set of examples, last summer, youth in London took to the streets to protest how their futures have been determined by biased and unaccountable exam grading algorithms. In the Koala Lab, we study how to design more effective human AI partnerships to realize the benefits of AI while mitigating its risks. In most of our projects, we take a participatory approach throughout all stages of building human AI systems. We start by developing collaborative research partnerships with relevant stakeholders in real world contexts. We then work to engage these stakeholders throughout the entire design and development life cycle for new technologies. Um, so this is from initial need finding and ideation to design decisions about the underlying algorithms to deployment in real world settings. And when working with data-driven AI systems today, this often requires the development of new kinds of design and prototyping methods. Finally, after we've developed new technologies, we conduct field experiments to understand the dynamics and causal impacts of these systems when they're deployed in real-world contexts. So shown here are some of the major research areas we work on. Today, I'll give an overview of just a few examples to illustrate some broad directions we're currently pursuing. Um, but if you're interested in learning more, you can visit our lab website, uh, the link at the top right corner. So first, a major focus area is supporting more effective and responsible human AI collaborations. We're interested in helping humans and AI systems better assess, inform, and potentially contest or disagree with each other's decisions. And to do this work, we're working across various real world contexts where AI systems are already being used to guide really high stakes, impactful decisions, such as the examples shown here. So as a second major focus area, we're interested in designing tools to empower workers in contexts where AI has the potential to help, but which fundamentally resist full automation. These include many care-based professions where human empathy and relationship building are central. But despite resistance to automation, care-based labor remains chronically undervalued. We can see this with underpaid and overworked social workers, school teachers in K-12, and caregivers for children, the elderly, and people with disabilities. One project we're working on under this theme focuses on co-designing algorithmic systems to empower in-home caregivers, currently one of the fastest growing segments of the American workforce. Increasingly, companies are introducing new algorithmic systems to transform what in-home care work looks like. Uh, but many of these systems tend to be designed in ways that center the needs of clients and employers while further disempowering the caregivers themselves. So in this project, we're working with caregivers to co-design new worker-centered prototypes. For example, fair scheduling algorithms, uh, interactive voice assistance for caregivers, as well as community platforms to support knowledge sharing and collective action among workers. Another set of projects we're working on focuses on the design and empirical evaluation of new tools to help machine learning practitioners assess and address unfairness in the systems that they develop. In some of our previous work, we investigated how and why industry product teams at major tech companies fail to detect unfair, uh, biased, and harmful behaviors in their systems before they're out in the real world making headlines like the one shown here. So in current work, we're following up on what we learned to make these kinds of events less likely in the future. In one ongoing project, we're designing interventions to address problems that are rooted in organizational and team behavior in companies. Our aim is to work with industry practitioners to redesign fairness toolkits, software packages that support fair machine learning efforts in companies. These software toolkits are commonly tailored for use by machine learning developers, and their designs provide little opportunity for input from other team members. 
we're exploring opportunities to instead promote more collaborative work practices across disciplines where UX researchers, social scientists, product managers, and others with relevant expertise for thinking about fairness, even at the algorithmic level, have a seat at the table. Whereas the project I just mentioned is trying to radically re-envision fairness tools, in a related project, we're currently taking a deeper dive to understand how developers are using existing fairness toolkits today to identify other areas for improvement in their designs. And in a third project with CMU faculty and PhD students, we're creating and empirically evaluating a new collective auditing platform. Our goal in this project is to empower everyday users of algorithmic systems, for example, image search engines, image tagging, social media, and so on, to surface unfair or harmful algorithmic behaviors to product teams as early as possible. This project aims to overcome limitations that we've observed with product teams existing practices for user testing or internally auditing their own systems. So many of our projects in the lab involve a mixture of research approaches from HCI and other fields. Uh, for example, projects often include design research, working with real world stakeholders to determine what we should design or conversely, what we absolutely should not design. Projects also often include building actual systems and involving stakeholders in this part of the process as well to ensure that we are designing and developing the right things. And finally, wherever possible, we try to deploy what we develop into real world contexts and study them out in the world. This process draws on a lot of different expertise. And so we tend to work very collaboratively. For example, we collaborate heavily with other faculty uh, across CMU and other universities, spanning a range of disciplines. And similarly, current students in the lab have backgrounds spanning a wide range of areas, some of which are shown on this slide. All right, so check out our website for more information. And beyond today's discussion, please feel free to reach out via email or Twitter. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sarah Fox. I'm an assistant professor in the Human Computer Interaction Institute here at Carnegie Mellon University. So here at CMU, I direct the Tech Solidarity Lab, where we seek to open up new opportunities for community-driven technology developments um, and extend theoretical frameworks that further our understanding of design, politics, and justice. So today I'll describe two key threads of our current research. So the first is on equitable smart cities and the second centers developing worker-centered design. So the body of research we're conducting on equitable smart cities examines the possibilities for co-developing co policies and technologies together. So ensuring that residents' concerns are heard and met in the process of deployment and adoption of public technologies by cities and states. So for example, we're examining micro mobility platforms and autonomous vehicles such that they center the needs of residents with disabilities. So outcomes of this work will include policy and regulatory recommendations, as well as altogether new interventions promoting accessible mobility to those across the city. And working with the Pittsburgh Task Force on Public Algorithms, we're also focusing our efforts on municipal technologies and how we might boost public education and democratic processes to ensure residents have a say in what gets implemented within local government from the start. So some ideas that have come from community meetings, for example, um, include an oversight board uh, or simply more stringent standards for how data is collected and circulated across government agencies and departments. In another key stream of research, we're considering worker-centered design, um, emphasizing the need to create technologies that support safe and meaningful employment with decent wages. So with fellow faculty members, Jody Forlizzi and Chinmay Kolkarni, and in partnership with the Hospitality Workers Union Unite Here, we're developing an approach to tech development that ensures workers' perspectives, insights, and expertise are considered in the design phase. 
So to give an example, we've learned through a series of workshops with housekeepers that the algorithmic management systems that are newly dictating um, much of their day-to-day -day work assign um, sequences of rooms without allowing for any customization according to their own preferences, which can um, lead to issues such as burnout and repetitive stress injuries. So the design decision um, here kind of represents the kind of oversight that we seek to mitigate in our own work. In collaboration with colleagues at the University of Texas at Austin, we're also examining the impacts of COVID-19 on the millions of people deemed essential workers who perform waste labor, such as cleaning, garbage collection, and recycling sorting. So since last year, there's been an accelerated push to introduce artificial intelligence technologies um, to better safeguard both the public and workers from the heightened possibilities of contamination through um, surfaces. Yet decades of human computer interaction research um, shows that the introduction of automated technologies um, into workplaces is not necessarily a seamless transition. Instead, it transforms and displaces existing work practices. So through observation, interviews, and co-design activities, uh, we're examining the frictions and corresponding innovations that workers produce um, throughout waste management industries um, as they deploy technologies in response to the COVID-19 crisis. So these are the acts of calibration, repair, and maintenance that workers do kind of on the ground with robotics and AI technologies. So the outcomes of this work will include a set of best practices for supporting human AI collaboration within low wage uh, work settings. And will kind of lead to insights that can be used across manufacturing and retail settings um, that also use kind of similar sorts of technologies. So with that, I just wanna say thank you for listening on the kind of recent research that we've been engaging in. And please do feel free to reach out if you have any questions um, or just want to chat. Well, thank you so much for these very interesting presentations. And um, if I may make an observation, it, it looks like the thread that works through both of your work is that user-centered design or participatory design can be a key tool as we try to bear, bring technologies to bear on some of society's wicked problems. So both of you are motivated to use technology to create a more just and equitable society. So maybe I'll come back to that point, but let me start with a question of where did it begin? So was there an aha moment or more broadly, when did you first realize you are excited about HCI, uh, so excited that you want to make it your career? And let me, let me uh, ask Sarah to go first. Yeah, that's a great question, the origin tale. <laughs> um, I think uh, for me, it really started, I, I kind of uh, went a roundabout way, honestly, um, as you might have seen or recognized in kind of Vincent announcing my <laughs> background, um, starting off um, in uh, some like media production, um, so in film and telecommunications, um, which is kind of an antiquated term nowadays for digital media development. Um, and then kind of moving on to um, HCI. So um, I, you know, where I went to undergrad, there was no such thing as HCI. We didn't have a department um, uh, like we're lucky to have here at CMU. So I, I came to it later. Um, I came to it, you know, post-grad and really actually through participating in a community design event. I was actually a community member, maybe being studied, <laughs> I'm not really sure, but um, just kind of witnessing the participatory design process from the other side and really um, became engaged that way um, and later applied to grad school to, um, to kind of enact and research um, myself. So that's, that kind of spurred the bug for me, um, the HCI bug. Thank you. Kim, what about you? Yeah, so um, my first exposure to research in general was um, through cognitive science. Um, and I was uh, conducting basic research in actually kind of a, an area of cognitive science that was extremely um, self-critiquing. Um, and so looked to HCI uh, methods more, more applied always was asking questions about the, the relevance of, of our approaches. 
Um, so I think through that, that was a nice pathway into a, a more applied uh, area. Um, but the, the content of the research uh, was largely to uh, understand through laboratory-based experimental studies, kind of the cognitive abilities that humans have, which consistently defy our best machine learning or AI systems. Um, so for example, being able to make strong inferences about causal structures in the world or structures in the social world, social inferences around us from very little information, whereas machine learning systems might need tens of thousands of data points. Um, and so this, um, uh, I, I became a huge fan of, of uh, human uh, cognitive abilities um, and uh, started thinking a lot ab about um, automation in workplaces through that lens um, where I was sold on the many, many things that humans can do, which uh, sometimes AI systems might be pitched as doing, but may not actually do that well, or at least not without extremely large uh, data sets. So I was interested in moving some of that into a more applied uh, realm. And it was around that time that I discovered that HCI was a field at all. So like Sarah, um, initially I did not know that HCI existed, but I'm glad that uh, we found it. Yes. Well, we're all glad you found it. Um, and so while we're asking about the origins, we would also love to hear like what attracted you to CMU? <laughs> Sarah, you want to go first? Oh, sure. Um, well, I mean, many things attracted me to CMU. I mean, there's the kind of stuff that attracted me from afar, but then after visiting, I think it's also a different, you get a, com a more complete picture. and. So initially, I mean, there's CMU HCII is like, you know, the place to do HCI research. I've been following um, researchers like, especially Jody for Lizzie and, and John Zimmerman, who kind of really spearheaded uh, the research through design um, kind of thread within um, broader um, HCI communities. So that I kind of looked up to and, um, and use a lot of those same methods in my own work. Um, so that was probably the initial attraction, I'd say. But I also was really drawn to CMU um, due to the kind of extensiveness of the um, collaborations that I witnessed, especially during kind of my on-site visits. So I recognized that, um, you know, there are a ton of people here that I was very interested in working with, um, and that that was a part of the culture. So collaborations are really common. Co-advising students, for example, is really common. And um, in other places I've been, I've been to a bunch of institutions at this point in my life. <laughs> and it's not necessarily a given um, that that would be encouraged or you know, very present. Um, so that was one another thing that was super appealing to me. Ken? Yeah. I'll, I'll maybe echo the, the last part. <laughs> that really was a really major factor for me. Um, I uh, saw CMU as a place where I could see people in statistics departments, philosophy departments working on causal modeling, working with um, learning scientists, uh, design researchers, um, that, that level of collaboration and the in incentives or la relative lack of disincentives for collaboration um, as uh, exemplified through co-advising being very common in the HCAI, for example, co-advising across disciplines um, was extremely attractive and not something that I was seeing everywhere. Um, and it's also the case that for HCI specifically, as Sarah said, uh, as soon as I discovered HCI a few seconds later, I think um, a search engine took me to CMU HCII specifically. Okay. Yeah, and I, I just wanna echo what one thing Ken said. There are so many schools across CMU that are so exciting and so strong in technology related research specifically. So the design school, the school of art, Heinz, you name, I mean, like go on and go on. I mean, like the list goes on and on. So the, the collaborative potential there was just so immense, it felt like, and still does. Well, so, th so that brings up the issue that HCI is a very interdisciplinary field. And, and sometimes that entails that people with very diverse backgrounds work together as maybe uh, exemplified by the HCI, fac HCI faculty who come from so many different fields, actually as illustrated by the two of you who come at this from very different directions. Um, sometimes also there is a single person who has an interdisciplinary background 
and I, in my opinion, the two of you are uh, a little bit in that mold, I would say. So could you share some insights as to whether and in what sense you view yourself as an interdisciplinary researcher and how your, your own interdisciplinary background has helped you in, that, in, as you, as you are, in your research in human-computer interaction? And let me ask Ken to go first this time. Yeah, yeah. So um, I guess I would consider myself an interdisciplinary researcher. I kind of have um, a, a, a set of disciplines that I draw upon pretty heavily. And I, I think I mentioned some of them in uh, my talk. Um, uh, and then there are also, uh, so I, I tend to be generally be driven by research questions. And so some of the research questions that I'm most excited about, um, the disciplines that I typically draw upon and have some expertise in will help me get part of the way, but not um, not all the way. Um, and so I, I guess just to give one example, um, connections to policy, that's generally not something that my background, uh, uh, that I have much much prior knowledge in. However, the sorts of questions that I'm interested in uh, always deeply connect to policy and ultimately the types of problems I'm interested in can't be solved by technology design alone. And so this is one place where collaborating with people like Sarah, uh, ends up being extremely important. Sarah? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, the low hanging fruit is gone. <laughs> no, that, I, um, yeah, I think I, yeah, I'm similar to Ken. I think there are, you know, questions that um, span or kind of um, yeah, are more expansive than can be answered by a single set of tools within a single discipline. So I think it's um, increasingly necessary, um, if not always has been necessary, to, um, to ask um, these questions collectively. Um, so as a set of researchers kind of coming together with certain expertise. So, you know, I really enjoy um, working with Ken, um, who has expertise in like AI design and also working with Motohari who comes with Motohari Aslami who appeared in one of these um, sessions earlier, I think maybe last week or the week before, um, who has expertise in auditing um, algorithms and um, is really engaged with um, the kind of technical community. So us working together kind of feels like a more robust way to respond to some of the kind of pressing questions that we've um, identified and, and many times um, disciplines are kind of asking similar questions like um, neighboring disciplines are asking similar questions but but from slightly different angles um, and so you know obviously there are power and there's power in numbers so why not come together um, and kind of figure things out um, and, and a, you know it's also much more fun not to work in isolation I think one of the big appeals also of the field of HCI is that it is um, broadly very collaborative. Right, yeah. And as our colleague, Bob Kraut often says, like uh, collaborative teams, uh, the more diverse they are, the actually, the, the less they enjoy working together, but the better <laughs> the work is. So, and I guess what I'm hearing from you is that no, it's also enjoyable to work with people who will bring different viewpoints and different expertise. Okay, well, let me come back to uh, something I said before, which is that uh, both of you in your videos show, uh, show that you are fearless in attacking some of society's really hard problems and express considerable optimism that the methods of human computer interaction could be an, and of human centered design and of participatory design could be applied to create a more just and equitable society. And I, I wanted to ask to share some of that optimism. Where does where does that optimism come from? Can you maybe share some spectacular examples or some some accomplishments from your earlier work that uh, that illustrate that? Well, who wants to go first? Challenging question. I'll ask Sarah to go first. Mm, yeah, I, I mean, I think it's it's interesting. I wouldn't have characterized it as optimism as much as necessity, <laughs> personally. I mean, it, it's um, it's a um, it feels yeah, it feels necessary. It feels urgent. I think that that's where the source of energy or motivation maybe comes from around some of these questions. Um, 
And I think that um, the, the nice thing about HCI research and methods is that it, it kind of, again, like we mentioned, we've been kind of talking about already is it comes at questions um, in a kind of multi faceted way. So it's not just kind of satisfied with um, kind of looking at the technical in isolation or the kind of social in isolation or, or so on and so forth, but it, it has to be um, considered together. Um, and so I think it naturally lends itself to these kind of tougher, these bigger questions of societal import. And, um, but I also think that there, it, it's important to have a certain humility about engaging these questions. So understanding the limits of particular HCI methods or the limits of introducing a particular technology, recognizing when, um, you know, maybe an intervention isn't actually working in the way that you expected it to and like being willing to um, redesign or iterate or even kind of pull um, pull out the technology altogether from that setting if it's doing harm um, in some cases. So, um, you know, the 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 research um, and the questions um, continue even after, say, deployment. Ken? Yeah, uh, no, I, <laughs> I um, was just kind of nodding along with everything Sarah was saying. I'm not sure I have that much more to add. Um, I, I, I have been called an optimist by, um, <laughs> by uh, strong critics of technology um, who view me as a techno optimist. I've also been called a pessimist by people who are more optimistic, <laughs> I think. So I'm, I'm not sure where I would put myself there. Um, but uh, I, I would say um, I am optimistic within certain bounds. Uh, so I think that the sort of work that I do and I do with uh, various collaborators around CMU and beyond um, often is trying to tackle what are ultimately really broad, thorny systemic problems. Um, and I don't have illusions about being able to, for example, design a technology and completely uh, solve all aspects of these problems, but I do tend to be optimistic about addressing parts of them. And different projects might try to address them on different timescales. Sometimes um, we're trying to reduce harm um, in the short term over the next few months. Sometimes a project might be trying to um, produce change over longer timescales. Yeah, I'll just to add on to that, I think um, the question of temporality, I think is really important. So like, you know, there, there are the kind of longer term, you know, goals that you might have and kind of recognizing like shifts in, you know, the status quo that doesn't happen immediately. But then there's also what needs to happen in the here and now, like Ken was saying to reduce harm in particular cases, or um, ensure that, you know, I mentioned like workers, for example, you know, having actual like physical injuries caused by particular design decisions, like that's obviously something we should address right now um, before even necessarily like rethinking algorithmic management systems altogether. We need to like just intervene on that right there. Um, but I think, um, yeah, I think I have also been accused of like <laughs> um, being kind of, um, I think I got in a peer review like why, why do you need to redesign? Why can't you just like, why do you have to, why do you jump to like rethinking a design? Um, why can't you just like point at the, be critical of the problem and kind of stay right there. But I, I personally, and I suspect Ken probably feels the same way, have not really felt satisfied with kind of pointing at the problem and like walk, essentially walking away or letting that be. That doesn't feel like responsible um, to me personally, or I just, I have the urge to continue. I. I really appreciate um, kind of really deep critical work. But I think the, with the tools that we have, the skills that we have, um, you know, as HCI practitioners and researchers, we have the opportunity to kind of take that, um, take those insights and those perspectives and kind of, um, you know, respond in certain sense. Ken, you want to add to that or? <laughs> Nothing more than nothing <laughs> than more. strong agreement, right? Yeah. Um. Well, so the question of yeah, optimism versus pessimism is very interesting. But let me so um. Let me ask, like, what? Yeah, what? What problems are the most? Yeah, what problems do you want to solve? Basically, what is most vexing? 
what's that itch that you that's keeping you working? What gives you joy if you could solve it? Well, Ken, why don't you go first? Yeah, yeah, those are a lot of good questions. So I especially like the what gives you joy if you can solve it question. Um, I, I have a lot of itches, so I, I won't be able to cover all of them, I don't think. But um, uh, one is definitely a, around participation in the design of algorithmic and AI systems. Um, uh, generally, just uh, these sorts of systems are increasingly impacting many, many areas of many, many people's lives. Uh, and yet uh, today still they're largely uh, left out of the process of designing, maintaining these systems and so forth. Um, and so developing better methods and processes for uh, involvement and oversight of algorithmic systems is, is a major itch. Uh, another major itch um, is uh, in increasingly, and I talked about this a bit in the presentation, uh, pretty high stakes decisions like uh, in education, healthcare, uh, child welfare are being made through a combination and integration of human and machine judgment. Um, but at, at this point in time, we still don't know very much about how to uh, combine what humans are really good at in making these decisions and what machines are good at. Uh, and so that's a question that uh, definitely drives a lot of my work and that I'm, I've been curious about for a long time. How about you, Sarah? Yeah, yeah. What? I mean, I think maybe a complementary concern is that I hold is around the public deployment of technology and the way the processes around that. So, you know, in um, in cities, I mentioned micro mobility as an example. So these are like e-scooters, um, networked um, bikes, and uh, delivery robots, and so on. So these have kind of popped up all across the country and in, in um, medium and, and large cities across the country and um, to mixed mixed uh, reviews so <laughs> some people enjoy the convenience um, you know the phrase that's often used is kind of um, linking uh, existing transit gaps um, to kind of um, allow people to get the last mile so you know if your bus stop is you know, a, a mile away from where you actually want to go, you can hop on a scooter or a bike and, and, and quickly get to where you need to go. So it's kind of um, sits within this kind of um, basically public um, private um, space. But a lot of these technologies were kind of um, implemented and deployed without uh, public consultation or voting or anything like that. And similar, that's a similar to some of the high stakes decision making um, tools that Ken has highlighted earlier in that a lot of times like the procurement of these technologies is kind of done behind the scenes. And so people don't even know that they're coming or that they're even implemented in the case of algorithmic decision making tools. So, um, you know, big, big aspects um, of movement through public life or access to public resources are determined increasingly by um, technologies, but nobody's voting on them. There's no kind of democratic process or participation that's um, uh, dictating them. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to kind of think through, you know, regulatory processes, but also, you know, if think through the aspirations that communities might have for the types of technologies they want. So, you know, it might not just be this kind of off the shelf scooter and it might not just be this off the shelf um, kind of smart street light. It could be something else entirely. So thinking through that collectively, I think is a really interesting space. Um, so thinking about both, yeah, here I am being optimistic again. I'm thinking about like regulation, um, but also like, you know, ideally what we want our cities to look like in the years and, and decades to come. Thank you. Yeah, so so I maybe if I may summarize this is what, what I think I hear both of you say is that while AI might be smart, the combination of AI and HCI could be much smarter and maybe the combination of AI and people. But those partnerships don't come about very easily. 
And so I was, so one question is, is there any sort of notable successes either from your own work or other people's work that, that you would like to share? Ken. Yeah, yeah, I mean, um, I guess two examples I think of uh, one line of work that I talked about um, a bit in the talk um, so I'll talk about it a little less here. It, it's some ongoing uh, work on um, uh, working with industry practitioners to uh, understand their needs for uh, improving fairness, um, whatever that may mean in particular contexts in uh, the development of machine learning systems um, and uh, tools for uh, helping developers of these systems to work uh, better work with uh, users of those systems, uh, affected stakeholders, community members who are impacted by the systems they develop, um, which relates to the conversation we just had. Um, on the, I guess, human AI partnership um, or complementarity side of things, um, in some prior research, uh, we explored uh, in an education space, K-12 teachers um, evolving roles uh, or their aspirations for their work um, as AI technologies increasingly enter their classrooms. And so we learned about a lot of aspirations, but also a lot of misgivings about the ways that existing technologies are implemented uh, in their classrooms. Um, and generally found that they were, were glad that someone was doing research. Um, they had a lot of experience with people doing research on the needs of their students, but a little bit less of people doing research on the needs of them as, uh, as workers, as practitioners. Um, and so as part of that work, we co-designed and developed um, a set of smart classes for K-12 teachers that supported teacher AI communication in, during class sessions where students were working with some of these AI technologies, which in turn would help um, teachers kind of stay in the loop. And then in turn, in some experimental studies we ran, we found that this combination of human teachers and AI systems um, ended up also yielding uh, stronger learning outcomes for the students. Very interesting. Sarah, what's your favorite example of, of a successful piece of work that you have done or maybe colleagues? Yeah, yeah. Um, I can, I'll, I'll talk about one. So this is not on AI specifically, although extensions of it could be, but um, some previous work I did looked at the space of menstrual resources so again, these are or these are um, products that are used to kind of take care when you are menstruating. So if you're a person who menstruates, and so I produced um, in collaboration with a set of advocates and facilities maintenance workers, uh, and a kind of updated um, menstrual product dispenser. So these are things that live in or are um, kind of installed in public restrooms. If you're not familiar, they hang on the wall and you sometimes put a coin in, sometimes they're free and it kind of dispenses. So um, it allows for people kind of to move throughout public space without worrying about having products. Um, and so we redesigned this technology. It's kind of an often overlooked piece of mechanical technology, um, often in disrepair, often empty. Um, and we learned this through field work and interviews across the United States. And so we redesigned this such that it emphasized maintenance. Um, so it allowed for kind of easier um, maintenance for facilities workers so they wouldn't have to go around and check. So it had like multiple keys. So you'd have to open one um, compartment and then another. Um, so it was really laborious, it was added work. Um, and the, um, the boxes were opaque, so you couldn't just glance. So it was an additional task and um, we also worked with advocates to produce kind of data streams that they could use in advocating um, for um, free products throughout um, public buildings in Washington state. So um, essentially we outfitted the dispenser with um, IoT technologies such that they, those, those bits of data could come in um, automatically and that could be used for their advocacy efforts. So, it held a dual purpose. Um, so ensuring public access, making that easier to administer, and then, um, you know, toward the aspirational policy end, um, kind of advocating more broadly. And um, 
yeah, it, in some ways that that was a, is an interesting like case study or experiment, but it actually kind of lived on in really interesting ways. So, you know, I continue to get calls about that project from <laughs> facilities organizations saying like, how did you go about doing this? Or, um, you know, uh, kind of what was the kind of institutional buy-in you needed from, you know, various organizations to get this done. And then Washington State has gone ahead and, and like done a lot of what's called like menstrual equity work at, at the legislative level. So that has continued on since I've left. But um, yeah, so that was kind of an interesting, you know, I think um, ex expression of a, like how a technical object can like have different like outgrowths um, or kind of pr prompt conversation to have around some of these issues. Wow, well, very interesting. You know, I think the examples that you're sharing seem to have in common that, that in order to design good technologies, it's so important to ground the designs in a deep understanding of what humans need, what they prefer, what they don't prefer, what they absolutely don't want uh, to put you in a good position to create something. I think we're slowly, we're coming close to the end of the session, which is very unfortunate because the many interesting things. So this may be my last question, we'll see. Um, how will you contribute to CMU's efforts to make the university diverse, equitable, and inclusive? I know we, both of you care about this a great deal and are addressing these kinds of themes in your research, um, but do you have any recommendations or relevant experiences that you would like to share? And, and Sarah, why don't you go first? Sure, yeah, so, um especially maybe from that last <laughs> response. Um, like gender and racial justice are very important to me in my work. Um, a lot of the work that I do really focuses on understanding um, kind of how technology um, may currently um, perpetuate bias or exclusion and, and then and kind of in turn figuring out ways to um, kind of push back or redesign or rethink um, how those technologies work. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm interested and committed to doing that through the work um, that I do in the lab and that my students do in the lab. I'm also um, working with Ken. I feel like Ken, we should just answer this question together, uh, especially around the kind of teaching aspect um, because we've been working together collaboratively with a, a number of graduate students and please do Ken hop in and other faculty and postdocs um, to develop a class on um, justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, as it relates to HCI um, topics. Yeah, and uh, I, I guess uh, between the two of us, a lot of the, the efforts are collaborative between Sarah and I, but, but also a, a bunch of other faculty. Um, these are really, um, which is exciting in, in the HCI and at CMU, um, a lot of collective uh, efforts, many of which are um, kind of uh, spearheaded by junior faculty, largely by junior faculty, PhD students, uh, postdocs, um, some master students. Um, so uh, an example is the, um, the Black Lives Matter Committee, um, which uh, uh, Patrick Carrington, who's one of our colleagues, uh, along with uh, Sarah and I and several other faculty, PhD students, postdocs, um, uh, set up a recruiting event last fall um, that was uh, meant to um, make sure that we were reaching out to more institutions that historically um, we've done a, a, a poor job perhaps at uh, reaching out to, uh, including um, various HBCUs. Um, and in turn, uh, it seems that those, there, there's evidence that those um, efforts were successful on the recruiting side. Uh, a second piece of this uh, is retention. Uh, in other words, making sure that we're um, contributing to changing the culture uh, at CMU, improving the culture um, so that as we bring in uh, more and more students uh, from demographic groups who typically have historically been underrepresented at CMU, we are actually uh, creating an environment that is, uh, is welcoming and, um, and a, a good environment for, for them to exist in safe and and for flourishing yes mm -hmm. um yeah so that has been kind of central to um a lot of things that we've been thinking about i would just also want to shout out uh the phd students and master students in hcii are incredible and have a number of initiatives underway 
as well and kind of community hours and things like this that they hold regularly again to kind of create um, spaces of um, support and um, and mutual flourishing so yeah yeah that was within within the event that we uh, the recruiting event actually we we had the uh, Erica Cruz uh, Lynn Caravo were a few of these uh, amazing PhD students who mm -hmm. um, uh, created spaces one of them was called the BIPOC community hour um, that ended up just being incredibly powerful to create a space to discuss um, experiences at CMU and in that case the recruiting event um, to share some of those experiences with people who are considering joining CMU. And so um, Erica and others have carried that work forward and have made that a permanent part um, of the HCII uh, with uh, BIPOC Community Hour and also uh, Queer Community Hour. And I believe there may be other community hours um, in progress. Well, that's it's great to hear that there is so much underway. Unfortunately, we've come to the end of our, our, uh, of our show. It was wonderful to talk to you all. I, I started by saying we have two prolific researchers. I think you've also gotten to know them now as sort of concerned citizens, engaged citizens, caring people. Um, I consider myself lucky to have you as our colleagues and I do wish you lots of great success. And thank you very much for your participation in this program. Um, thank you attendees for joining. Maybe we'll give them a round of applause for our panelists. I don't think you can hear, but I think it's loud. Mm -hmm. um, I wish I could say, meet our speakers in the lobby where uh, a nice spread is waiting for us. This is not the case. Nonetheless, we were glad to have you all. Um, so this was recorded. We'll post recording once it's ready, once it's captions and edited. Uh, so you could go over this, recommend it to colleagues, friends, and family. And uh, thank you so much. This this is the end of our show. Thank you, Vincent. Bye -bye. Thank you all for yeah. joining. Thank you.